So any hardware hackers out there? Just a couple? Well, this, this tool is intended to make it easier to get into that. So hopefully we'll end up at the end of this talk with a few more. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand, feel free to interrupt. Uh, I'd be happy to do it. This is a pretty informal talk. Um, it's, it's geared around more about demonstrating the tool than uh, talking about it, but I am gonna talk about the process uh, of building it just so you can uh, <laughs> see that, uh, you know, maybe it'll inspire you to try and uh, build something on your own. Before I did this, I only had a moderate knowledge of, of how to use EDA tools like KiCad specifically. And by the end of it, uh, I felt like I really knew what I was doing. So it, it's a great way to get into that. So who am I? Uh, I'm a principal, cult uh, principal consultant at Mandiant, a pen tester. Uh, I do a lot of embedded systems testing, but also a lot of other generic, uh, you know, network, external, web app, that sort of testing, uh, mobile application, things like that. But my, my specialty, my passion is embedded systems. Uh, and I'm professionally known for actually breaking those systems that I'm working on. That's, that's uh, what I did. And probably the biggest, the first one I did was uh, ooh, about 10 years ago. Uh, I had a BMW, don't judge, I, I like the way it drove. Uh, and I wanted to have an iPod interface in it. And I thought it'd be easy. I thought it's just a little USB connector that'll run to the back of the head unit. It turns out it was a lot more complicated than I thought, but I decided to tackle it anyway. Uh, you can see in the middle picture here, it has uh, some fiber optic cables. The orange cable is the one that I had to add and splice into a fiber optic loop. Uh, that's called the most loop if for those uh, automotive people out there. That's uh, basically it's a multimedia loop designed to pass audio data and I actually had to recode uh, everything. It turns out the uh, USB interface actually routed itself back to a telematics unit in the trunk, and then that spliced into the most loop, and then that most loop uh, moved up to the head unit. But I figured it out, um, and as I was recoding the car to tell it that it actually had that interface, I forgot to hook up a battery maintainer and bricked the car. Uh, so what I had to do is I actually had to boot it back up and finally I figured out what it was is it was in transport mode, uh, which is what they do to uh, preserve battery life when it's uh, on a roll on roll off ship uh, moving across the ocean. Uh, once I figured out how to do that and get it back and after adding a few gray hairs to my inventory, uh, I got it back and, and now I had iPod. Uh, um, and I felt like, oh wow, I, I'd actually bricked it and brought it back. Uh, now for a more expensive brick. This was a few years ago. This was during the pandemic. Uh, I had one of these. It's a Tesla Model S, and I decided I wanted to make it faster. Uh, when, I, when the car was sold, uh, I was the second owner. It didn't have ludicrous mode. It just had what was called insane mode, and I had to get that extra half second of zero to 60 time. So I decided I wanted to figure out how Tesla did that in the service centers uh, so I figured it out. I have a test bench, which I, I'm actually going to show J JTAG connectivity on. Um, worked through the process and figured out how to add ludicrous mode to it. I had to drop the battery pack, replace the contactors, replace the fuse, and reflash the BMS with different code. Uh, during the, the, refla the reflash process, putting the battery back in the car, all worked fine. Uh, it accepted, it accepted the new battery ID. But the cars have this thing called a security gateway. And the security gateway actually stores the configuration of the car, what battery pack you have, you know, what air conditioning model revision you have, uh, the drive units, every component on the car from all the way up to the door handles have their own little code that goes into this configuration. And uh, me in my vanity, I wanted the little icon for biohazard mode, even though I didn't have the proper climate control units for it. I just wanted that little biohazard symbol on my, uh, AC when I clicked on it. And because my car didn't have the hardware for that during the process of recoding the battery and everything else, it died. Uh, and it wouldn't take the, the reflash. It wouldn't allow me to re-engage the contactors. The parking brake was locked. And I had to get it towed home across state lines. And it, during the process of uh, basically being miserable and commiserating with uh, about the big mistake I did. I figured out the problem was by looking at the log files that I generated and figured it out that it was that, that one little configuration line that I added, removed that, uh, reflashed the car, it came back alive, and, and now I have ludicrous mode. So that was my second very expensive brick. 
but it taught me an awful lot about the car configuration and uh, UDS, car hacking in general, it was a fun process. Uh, I also did some avionics hacking uh, with some help of a gentleman in the audience who's uh, waving right now. He was a, a big help. It, it took two and a half years from findings to release. And it was a, a pretty momentous occasion, but I feel like we actually made some really strong, positive change in the industry now. Uh, there's an, actually an aerospace village now that, where they, they freely discuss these type of things. And uh, I, I kind of had the, a release on the kind of the first year of that aerospace village and, and felt like we really moved, uh, moved the needle in actually allowing security researchers out there to do this type of research. Um, in a positive way, doing it right, working with industry, uh, you know, doing responsible disclosure, all the rest of it. So uh, why do we need another USB to serial device? We have the time up, we have the Tigger, we have all these little units like this, units like this that you can come up and see if you want. Um, I had some particular use cases that I needed it for that uh, I didn't want to have a big spaghetti mess of like five USB cables sticking out of my device. So I decided to create my own. Um, so I, I had, was trying to basically connect to serial devices on both ends. And for that, you actually need two UART connectors because you have to have deal with the send and receive and then be able to join those connections in the middle. Um, I had a Tigger that had level shifters because I was dealing with something that was working at 1.8 volts. Um, and I had my little four port uh, module, so I decided to basically combine them together. And I came up with the name Cerberus. And honestly, the name took me longer than the design. I went through so many other iterations before I stumbled across this one. So it's like a combination of Serial Bus and Cerberus, the, the multi-headed dog. And do you like my AI generated image that I created for this? Um, or that some AI created for me that I took. Uh, so combine the two. So it, this device that I created, and here's the, the first real prototype of it, uh, has three UART connectors and then multi, one multifunction JTAG uh, SWD. Uh, 10 minutes in or 10 minutes left? Okay. <laughs> I wanna make sure I understood the signs, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, SPI, I2C connectors, uh, a level shifter that you could absorb connections. You could basically connect to devices that worked at a logic level of 1.6 all the way to 5.5. It's the lower levels where you run into problems. If you're dealing with a really low power IoT device or home device and you just try and use a regular uh, USB to UART device, it, it may not, um, the, the ones or the, the positive signals may not rise up enough to actually trigger and, and be identified as they are, so that's why you need the level shifters. Uh, another, some other things that I wanted to change, I wanted to simplify the connectors. I wanted to use an MSO style ribbon connector. Uh, if anyone has ever used a mixed signal oscilloscope, uh, you know they have like the little 20 pin IDE connector that breaks out into uh, 20 separate pins that you use to connect to your logic device. I wanted to have that simple connector on it. And then also the, um, the Seger, which is a very common and, and kind of professional level JTAG debugger device has that same style of connector. Uh, I also wanted the ease of connecting up a logic analyzer. Uh, for those of you who do hardware hacking, you know how much you use a logic analyzer. Um, having it directly on the line without having to have multiple connections on the little tiny pins that you connect to uh, little made uh, my workflow a little bit easier. So we added that. Um, and then it has a, a single little like Cortex debug connector on it as well. Uh, anyone who's actually used a Seger J-Link has seen one of these adapters. You're moving from you know, your standard 2.5 millimeter pitch device uh, down to some really small connectors because your typical Cortex debug connectors you can see down here in the lower right has a really fine pitch and use these really tiny ribbon cables to connect directly to the device. Uh, the little snap-in connectors for programming devices, it, it's the same story. I uh, you know, need to be able to connect those up and trying to have a whole bunch of DuPont wires scattered across that uh, makes it a little more difficult, whereas if you just have a single thing that you can plug in and do your flash programming directly, I, I thought that might make it a little bit easier. And, and it has, as, as you'll see when I connect to this automotive target. Um, and then uh, I wanted indicators for each TX and RX. Um, the the chipset on this is the FTDI 4233. 
Uh, the 4232 and the 4233 don't have enough pins to drive eight separate LEDs. So what they actually do, and they didn't really define this in the earlier versions of the data sheet, is they actually use the EEPROM connectors. So on an FTDI, you can program your own serial number, your own VID, PID, which is how the computer identifies itself and which drivers to use. Um, that's all programmed on this little tiny EEPROM on the device. It's, it's right down here below the main chip. But it only uses it during the initial startup of the device. So they, they repurpose the EEPROM connectors up to the shift register and use it to drive the uh, LED indicators. I included that uh, feature on this. So uh, now I'm gonna show the UART demo. What? Yeah. We gotta make a, an offering to the demo gods here that this will work. This is the first of three demos, so we'll have uh, time for plenty of the other ones. So I don't like to use putty. Okay, let me make sure I have this correctly selected. Yeah, COM3. So when you connect it up, uh, it'll actually, let me uh, bring that back up because it's a, it's a good thing to show. It'll show up as four separate uh, serial, USB to serial ports in your, in your machine. Um, on a Linux machine, it'll be a dev TTY. Uh, I like this particular application for what you'll see in a little bit when I do the avionics demo, but you can see it showing up as COM3, 4, and 5, and 6. The first, COM. Right. Don't mind me, but okay. we want to make sure we catch all your words because you're going to be back and forth. Okay. It seems. Sorry for the interruption. So here, put this here. Put this on the pocket for you, yep. like on the edge. And then we're going to go ahead and mute that. Okay. Give it one second. Was it uh a lot cutting out. How's that? How's the audio? Guys, can We're you good? 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no problem. One other question. Are you going to put that on the big screen or is that only down here? Uh, that's only down here. There's no way to put that up on unless you have a camera well, that can point it at it. So that's what we're doing is going to okay. point the camera to try to catch what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to do it from above. We don't have one of those mirrors. So tell us if so. you need to follow you or, or that, please. Sounds good. Okay. And let me move this. And you can actually see the device booting here. So this is just a simple uh, demonstration of the basic UART connectivity. This is a Wi-Fi router that's no longer in use at, at my house. And uh, it's a great way to get into embedded hardware hacking. That's why I wanted to show this one. Uh, if you wanna start learning about testing embedded systems, uh, if you have an old Wi-Fi router, rip it open. 99% chance you're gonna have some type of pin header that looks like this on there. And all you have to do is either solder on the pin header or just connect to it if you don't have it. Um, you can use a, a little $20 Amazon logic analyzer to verify which one's the transmit pin and you'll be able to see the device boot. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, that shows well enough up on the screen. Uh, and that's just to show, you know, very simple connectivity. I have it connected to the, uh, the first UART. Uh, you can actually send and receive on this, but this particular device takes a really long time to boot. 
So uh, I'm gonna skip this and, and move back to the uh, rest of the presentation. And if you look closer, you can actually see it flash. Uh, that's one of the indicator lights. That's a really good way to check and actually see if you have, have connectivity is to verify the status of those indicator lights. So moving on from that, uh, I, now while that one boots and I can show the two way, I'm gonna just talk about the, uh, the design process. So uh, first I just built a proof of concept using a breadboard. Uh, it was a really ugly, unclean signal, but it verified that I could get uh, all four channels working simultaneously off of just a dev board, demo board of the FT4233 that I ordered. Um, I should also mention uh, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't even pretend to be one. I took a couple of years in college and then got distracted by college. Uh, I got, ended up getting my degree in economics, but it still kept an interest in it. Uh, but if you asked me to like recite Kirchhoff's equations, I, I couldn't do that. Uh, but what I can do is like look at a data sheet and um, copy what's on it uh, pretty realistically. So I, I can hack at it, which is um, the, where I'm kind of going with that is don't think you have to be an electrical engineer to build something like this. This, um, I, you know, I looked at the signals on this on, on a scope. Uh, they're all really clean. I just followed the, uh, the guidelines for how to uh, clean up a signal, how to provide stable power to a device. And there's even another device where I provided uh, like a stable 30 volts through a voltage regulator. And I just by following the guidelines and using the built-in dev tools that the, uh, the board manufacturer had out there. Uh, something complicated, yeah, you need to have to be a double E, but a, a very simple device like this, don't be intimidated by it like that. If you want to try designing your own badge, uh, go get KeyCat, it's free. And download it, install it, and, and just start playing around with it. You can um, find plenty of open source designs out there where you can download the schematic, you can download the, the Gerbers and start moving stuff around, seeing how to route things, and, and that's really how I figured out the process. Uh, so this is how power works. Uh, as I can see, it has a, if you can see, it has a little switch on the front. Um, that switch is designed to, to select the voltage level of your target. Um, you can see that there's a 1.8 volt voltage regulator. That's this guy up here. There's a 3.3 volt regulator. That's the uh, middle position. And then for five volts, it actually just uses the USB level, which is at approximately five volts, but it's basically close enough. Uh, there's a little, um, uh, basically, it, it's like a power protection chip that's uh, right off of the, the USB connector uh, that's necessary in this per with this particular chipset. Uh, the indicators, this is the level shifter that uh, has that. And you can see there's a, just a couple caps in here to clean up the power, um, alternating red and green. Uh, here's a little bit more on the level shifter. So I had to add, uh, the other designs out there had two level shifters, I had to add a third as an additional output buffer. And what those do is they take the voltage level of the FTDI, which is, i th pretty sure it's 3.3 volts, and you'll shift it up or shift it down. And there's also a fourth position on the switch where you can basically select, it'll actually run off of the voltage of your target. If you have something running at a really bizarre voltage, like 1.6 volts, uh, 1.6 is the minimum of these level shifters. Um, all the way up to 5.5 if you're if the logic level is is shifting that dramatically and it will adapt the signal on the FTDI side down to the 3.3 or on the on the output side it'll shift it up to the uh, voltage level of your target uh, so this is the the first attempt um, put everything together by hand uh, the 402 components were really interesting to hand solder they're about just a little bit bigger than a grain of sand uh, but I have a microscope, so I figured it out, and um, it worked. But I discovered right away that the little 20-pin uh, JTAG connector, because of the little ears on the end of it, uh, wouldn't plug into it. So it was it was not compatible with the initial design. So then I went in to the second version, and the second version I did very quickly, and I just searched JTAG pin out. Turns out I gra grabbed the wrong JTAG pin out. I uh, had the grounds and the uh, signals reversed. So the, the grounds were actually on the keyhole side instead of on the other side. And so I did one more revision. Um, also decided to you know put some additional labels in it to figure out everything. The only label I really want to add now is one that identifies 
uh, the voltage level. So when you, you know if you're moving the switch left or right, if it's going up or down in voltage. Uh, and then I ordered some prototypes via PCB way. Uh, so I got 25 of them um, to hand out to uh, co-workers because I'm not allowed to hand them out to people that are not uh, employees of my company just yet while we're working through the release process. Um, and uh, we're at the current revision. So here's how to use it. Uh, serial access, I kind of already showed you. Uh, you can either just use putty, specify the baud rate, uh, or use screen or whatever your, your favorite tool is. This one is just a very simple uh, serial tool on a Mac. Uh, for, for JTAG, now it's getting a little bit more complicated and I'm gonna show the demo of that one in just a minute. Um, if you try and use open OCD out of the box, just do you know apt install open OCD, it probably will not work. The package maintainer's version of open OCD doesn't have all of the FTDI chipsets supported out of the box. Uh, fortunately, it's very easy to build. There are very few dependencies. Uh, you can just pull it off of GitHub and, and do a build. And then when you're doing the configure, you just have to enable FTDI or, or any other additional chipsets that you want to use. Um, and here's a little example showing that it actually worked. Uh, for uh, JTAG SPI for doing flash programming, if you want to dump flash ROM off of something or actually use it to program flash, uh, flash ROM itself is a little buggy, a lot for the same reason that it's using a fairly recent FTDI chip, but FTDI Python you can use to dump flash and that works really well. You just need the device URIs. If you run LSUSB, it'll give you the uh, uh, PID, VID PID of 403 and 6041, which uh, you need to specify using the, uh, the, the Python tool, and it'll show up, and this is one of the four URIs that'll show up uh, on your, your Linux machine. And now for the JTAG demo. So what I have here is an automotive target. I'm gonna try and connect it, make sure it's in the JTAG mode. So there's a switch. up here next to the, uh, the level shifter selection that switches it between serial wire debug and JTAG mode. Um, it uses the same sets of pins, uh, but you know where you need like the pull downs and pull ups and everything else is a little bit different, but it just to move it between those two modes, it's a single uh, switch connection. This is gonna be JTAG though. Or this one. Okay, yeah, it's showing up. You can see 4036041. And yes, I know I'm running uh, Open OCD as sudo, and that is a bad habit. Don't do that. And you can see right here, it can see the freescale freescale chipset on this uh, automotive target. Um, this particular Freescale chipset doesn't have any other definitions supplied under Open OCD, so I can't really do anything else exciting with it. Um, with, but with this, if you were to read through the, uh, the JTAG descriptor for it and define your own uh, chip, define your basically your own definitions on this, you could uh, dump the, the gateway configuration. What I'm actually connected to, if we get the camera to grab that in a second, to zoom in on this is I'm connected to the outside pins of this connector right here. This is the JTAG connector for the, the vehicle's security gateway. Um, for an automotive target, a security gateway is essentially the firewall of a car. And, and I have uh, basically JTAG access to this. JTAG, I can read write, I can halt it, I can change the specification, I can do whatever I want to. Um, the security gateway sits between the CAN buses of the vehicle and the infotainment system, you know, the internet connection, everything else. So it's, it's a very juicy target. That's the one that had the uh, configuration file that I had to change when I did the, uh, the ludicrous stuff that I talked about earlier. 
and I'm gonna grab this chip I dropped just so I don't forget it. This is the actual main CPU that drives the screen. It's an NVIDIA Tegra. Uh, it's an interesting target because it's the same processor that's run on the Nintendo Switch, uh, subject to all the same vulnerabilities. And luckily it, it has a little hidden USB connector that gives you U-boot access as well. So um, have fun if you wanna explore that. Uh, these uh, aren't used in the current versions of the automotive uh, of the car they came from anymore. They've moved like two revisions past that, uh, went to like Intel Atom, and now I think they're on an AMD Ryzen version of a, of a CPU. But the NVIDIA, Te Nvidia Tegra um, has some hardware level vulnerabilities, so that, that's why they, they moved off of that. Um, the, the gateway itself, though, that's it's a pretty juicy target if you ever want to start uh, messing around with car hacking. That. All right, so now we get into the other uh, use case for this particular device, and that's multiple serial. Um, I had intended to show examples of um, the Acron proxy with this particular device, uh, but I, I broke my distribution on doing that, and uh, hope maybe I'll have it working by DEF CON. Um, more importantly, though, I will be able to actually show connecting to the, the avionics, and, and that's really the the fun stuff. Uh, the other thing that basically, the cool thing about Acheron Proxy, it's one of the few serial man in the middle tools out there. So what you can do is you have an embedded device, uh, there's an inter-chip um, communications that might occur over serial. Really common things like cellular modems. Uh, did I just drop out? Okay. Uh, really common for things like cellular modems, you'll see it like run AT commands just over the serial bus. Uh, and if you can get in the middle of that, uh, you can do some interesting things. Uh, so one of the use cases of this is, is to actually find the serial bus, make some small cuts on the board, and then connect one UART to each end, and then use software to join those two, and then occasionally modify uh, data on the fly, and with uh, actor on proxy, you can actually do that. Uh, here's an example of it actually setting it up on this one, uh, watching data pass. Uh, this is actually from, from their site. Uh, I had it working for a little bit, but then I, I broke some stuff. Uh, and then this is uh, pretty much the use case that I wanted to show before I was told not to. Um, this is transponder communications. Now this particular avionics set does not have a transponder. Um, that's by design, um, but if you look at the communication on this screen, you can see something right away. You'll notice that the messages always begin with one zero, and then it's two or C, but if you, if you look at where the bits line up, it, it's a pretty easy mask to identify. And it always ends in one zero zero three. So using that, it's pretty easy to actually look for that sequence of bytes and, and break on it and realize that you actually have you know, the message incrementing. Um, and I'm gonna show that on the avionics here in just a second. So now we got the, uh, the fun part, the avionics demo. This is gonna take me just a minute to plug in. Again. Thankfully, there's really good lighting in here and I can see what I'm doing. Success, okay. Um, did this presentation earlier at, uh, at Black Hat and any time I tried to connect up two units at the same time, um, it would lock everything up. I think there's, it's probably because there's some different grounds going on. It doesn't make sense entirely, but 
I'm not going to take that chance. I'm just going to show on this one and show how there's another one just, just right here next to it, just because it's, it's the demo gods, and they're being kind right now, so I don't want to uh, tempt fate. So you can see I'm using uh, this tool H term. And right now it looks like garbage because it's all in actual hex. So we don't want to see ASCII. Now I happen to know that it's a 21 byte message. Now if you hook up a, a logic analyzer, it's not working. Oh. Okay, I'm actually hooked up to the other unit on this. Ah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to reset. I spoke too soon about the uh, the demo gods. Oh, I know the problem is. I have to set the right baud rate. Ah, oh, there we go. Yay. All right, so you can see that I've got the same beginning and end uh, of the messages here, and they are all in hex. Uh, all the messages from this particular device. Now, this one has a completely open design. Um, the source materials, so basically the, the, the software interface specification, if you will, uh, for this particular avionics set is, is completely open. They tell you how to build devices that interface with it. So they'll basically tell you that uh, the start of message is in 8.2 and uh, the end is in 8.3 in hex. Now, you'll notice, uh, are we zoomed in on the uh, Mr. Camera person? Uh, are we zoomed in on the avionics? Okay, uh, you'll notice, can you see the data shifting? I can't really see it from this angle. And then this is the uh, attitude heading reference system. Basically that's uh, the electronic gyro of the avionics. It's basically telling it where its relation to is, is into the ground and how quickly it's changing. Now it gets its truth also from the compass, which I have a connector to, but uh, maybe right here at the end, we'll try and connect to that and see if we can get both at the same time. Um, but uh, the, the main method of communication on this device is actually CAN bus, but because they want to be interoperable, they also offer serial. So um, I've connected up to the serial so we could do additional instrumentation work and uh, exploration of it, uh, but it also it'll ha connect up to a transponder, connect up to a radio. Um, ADSBN, so it'll actually see the aircraft around it and just put them up on the display here. But you can see everything shifting as as the gyro on this particular device moves. So now that I've shown that, uh, any questions before we uh, try and tempt fate and see if I can get another connection on this? All right, good. Let's let's try it. Way. Hey, look at that. Great. So 
sort of working. Or not ask. You can see it's a little unstable of a connection here. Now it's this is just connected up to the compass. Now the compass has one position. Basically, it, it doesn't care about attitude. It can, just basically cares uh, about uh, direction of travel in relation to magnetic north. I'm going to disconnect the other one just in case that's what's causing the issues. And it's not. Maybe I just have a bad serial uh, converter here. So this one, yeah, well, it's acting up a little bit. Now, um, we need to get, get in and actually troubleshoot that one. Uh, you can see it's, it's coming in, but it's a little bursty and it, it's a little bit unstable. Uh, but it works. We can actually connect uh, multiple ones at the same time. Now, does anyone know why I actually have to use these converters? Uh, what's the difference between UART and RS-232? You want to come up to the microphone, man. <laughs> Were you in the cell class? Huh? Were you in the cell class? The cellular implementation class at Black Hat? Yes, I was. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So um, you are, it usually refers to like uh that's the logic level signal. That'll be like the zero to 3.3 .3 volt or the zero to five volt or whatever, whatever uh, supply voltage is used by the, uh, the digital logic, or your microcontroller and all that. RS-233 is an older standard. And what they do is they take the UART signal in and then they drive it, it's a single ended, but they'll drive it either to like plus 12 or minus 12 volts. I mean, I think it'd be anywhere in the range of yeah. minus three to plus three to plus 20 something to minus 20. So what ends up happening is like if you if you have like a logic high from like a UART TX, the, the RS-232 line transceiver will translate that into like a negative voltage, like a negative yeah. 12 volts. And when you go zero, it'll do the opposite. So yeah. it's sort of like inversion. And boy, I just gave my age away, didn't I? Yeah, that, that's actually a great way to describe it. So really what that means is if you're looking at a board and it looks like RS-232, but you're not quite able to decode it, Try inverting the signal. Or, sorry, if, it, if you're looking at a signal and it looks like it's a UART signal, um, try inverting it. It might just be straight up RS-232. Uh, because it's an inverted signal, uh, zeros will appear as ones and ones will appear as zeros. And a lot of the logic analyzers won't go negative, so you'll just be seeing the positive swings on it. But it'll look like a serial signal, but it's, it's just a little bit different. OK, uh, so at that point, I've uh, concluded where I am at. Uh, the the device itself is all the designs are on uh, Google's site here, Google Cerberus. Um, I don't quite know how I'm going to sell it yet, although I know they allow it. I just have to work myself through the process. However, that doesn't mean you can't get one. Um, all the KiCad files, all the Gerbers, uh, the bill of materials, everything that you need to build your own is out there, and it's going to stay that way. Um, they, they patented the device, but they patented it for intention of releasing as an open source. So really, they just don't want you try, like, trying to copy it and, and sell it. It's, although, when I get it out there, I intend it to basically be as, at my cost of creation, so embedded testers can actually use the device. Um, I just have to figure out how to do it in a way that's not going to get me in trouble with, uh, with the, the great um, uh, people that decide whether what's acceptable at, at, at my company. And thank you. <laughs>